Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode number 122 of ADHD for Smartass Women. In this episode, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Carolyn... Oi, I'm going to get this right, Carolyn. <laughs> Dr. Carolyn Lynch Parcells. Dr. Lynch Parcells is a board certified pediatrician and the owner and president of Girls to Women Young Men's Health and Wellness Fort Worth a multifaceted clinic providing integrated medical care dedicated to meeting the physical and emotional needs of young women and men ages 10 to 25 years old. As a physician with ADHD herself, she has a special interest in caring for patients with ADHD and learning issues. Dr. Lynch Parcells regularly speaks to parent, student, and professional audiences on subjects such as parenting, ADHD, depression, anxiety and stress, adolescent development, sexuality, preparing for college, and of course, medication. Caroline, did I get all that right? I think so, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. So, I think I told you this, but I heard you speak two years ago on the ADHD Women's Palooza with Linda Rogley about medication. And ever since then, I knew I had to get you on this podcast. I have never heard anyone speak more knowledgeably and more relatably on medication for women than you. Well, thank you. Absolutely. So I want to talk all about medication, obviously. But before we go there, I would really love to hear your diagnosis story. Would you mind sharing it with us? Sure. So I was actually pretty lucky, especially for, for our generation and especially as a woman. I was, I'm not actually completely sure when I was officially for Scherzi's diagnosed, if you will, but I did have a testing done when I was 17 that suggested diagnosis of ADHD combined type and a learning disability in reading and written expression. And, you know, that was pretty early at that time. And especially since so many of us as women, you know, often fell through the cracks still to this day, but especially back then. And really the reason I was diagnosed as young as I was, is we had a family member who had some more significant symptoms and was male. And so they were going through the diagnosis process and my parents were like, Oh, hold on. That's what's going on with her. And they had me diagnosed you know, at the time, I think, you know, I was 17. And as many of us, when we're 17, I knew everything at the time. <laughs> and I think part of it was I, I wasn't totally ready to accept the diagnosis, but also I, I thought I was doing okay. You know, I was getting decent, I was getting pretty good grades at a pretty rigorous private school. And I was thought I was holding my own and I was in a lot of ways. Looking back on it now, I realized that it was at a cost. You know, it was at a cost to my sleep. It was at a cost to my mental health. It did take its toll on me. And I did get accommodations. I accepted accommodations. I did not accept medication at the time. 
I did not want to use, I think as many of us kind of feel initially, I didn't want to use my diagnosis or medication as an excuse or as a crutch. And like I said, I still wasn't, I wasn't convinced I had a problem, right? Because I, it's all I knew, you know, that was who I was. And interestingly though, I think one of the things that was different and kind of unique for me, again, especially back then is my parents were actually very supportive and they were supportive of medication. They were supportive of treatment. My mom, one of my mom's favorite phrases when it comes to things like ADHD and mental health is, you know, if you were diabetic, you you'd take your insulin, right? So why wouldn't you take your medicine for these kinds of things? It's the same kind of thing. So I was very lucky that I had that kind of support and that kind of perspective from them, but I just wasn't ready myself. And of course, I think again, as many of us, I wouldn't mind going back and smacking my 17 year old <laughs> self because she made things a lot harder than they needed to be. And, um, but like I said, I did accept accommodations and that was actually when I kind of realized, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess there is something to this because I, I never thought I was stupid by any stretch of the means, but I didn't realize what I could do. And I took my SATs and my SAT twos initially without extended time. And then I got my diagnosis and I got accommodations and I took them again. And I went, I'm sorry, my score was what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think you got that wrong. Uh, <laughs> did I do the math right? Um, you sure? And, and I just didn't realize, like I said, I didn't, I didn't think I was stupid. Um, but I just didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't realize what I could do. And I didn't realize how much of an effect that the ADHD and the learning disability were having on me and on my performance. So I had accommodations, uh, towards the end of high school and I had them through college and I had them through medical school, uh, very gratefully, but I avoided medication for quite some time, actually. So what were some of the symptoms that your parents saw, but you didn't see? Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what everybody saw and everybody still sees is the hyperactivity. <laughs> I am a perfect example of the fact that not everybody grows out of that. Yeah. Um, just ask my staff. They will be more than happy to tell you. <laughs> um, so no, I was, I was, I was quite hyperactive as a child and I went to an all girl school. So for a good chunk of my, my growing up. and so you know, I kind of st stood out actually, again, I think more so than, than girls typically do, because I didn't have a bunch of hyperactive boys around me. So I, the hyperactivity was definitely a big piece of it. The focus, the attention, staying on task, whoo, easy distractibility, easy distractibility, just, you know, constantly run by a motor, if you will. My brain just doesn't stop. And, you know, my mom, I think, recognized that at a pretty young age and had me in activities. I had activities almost every day. And it's not because we were like, you know, crazy over scheduling type people. It was because my mom knew I needed to move mm. and she had to keep me moving um, or, or things were not good. So, yeah, I was I was a very, very busy child. Very busy child. So what changed once you were diagnosed? And did you yeah. tell your friends or were you really kind of quiet about it? Sure. So again, I didn't really need to tell people kind of obvious, <laughs> um, to be honest. Um, no, I did. I, I did tell my close friends. I didn't tell everybody. I didn't scream it from the rooftops like I do now, mm. but I did. I did tell my good friends. And again, they were not surprised again, even back then before it was as widely known as it is now. And again, I was very lucky. I got, I, I had a lot of support from my friends and from my family. As far as what changed, well, the biggest thing that changed initially was the accommodations. And that really was, that was a big game changer for me. And because I, I was always that kid that did not get to the end of the test. Or if I did, it was like, you know, the last chunk of it, I'm just like, you know, if it's multiple choice, I'm going B, 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 right? Like all mm -hmm. the way down the road, I was always rushed. And I did a lot of what I got done right. So much of it didn't get done that really kind of dragged me down and it caused a lot of anxiety, right? So can I ask you, were you slow because you were in your head a lot and, and constantly second guessing yourself as far as, you know, like multiple choice type stuff? So 
a little bit, it kind of depended on the test. So with multiple choice kind of things or like, you know, kind of short answer type questions, it was, there was the anxiety component and there was the ADHD component. There was the second guessing myself and, and getting in my head too much for sure. There's the overanalyzation of, wait, is that what they really meant? Well, what about this? And did they mean this or did they mean that? And there's actually more than one answer to that. That's not a yes or no question. That's not a true or false question. That's a right. Yeah. So there was definitely that. But then there was also because of the distractibility and again, the learning, you know, they diagnosed me with a learning stability and reading and written expression. And I, I'm not saying that wasn't there. I think it probably was to a certain extent, but again, looking back on it, I kind of wonder how much of my processing issue was actually the untreated ADHD, right? Yeah. In hindsight. But regardless, there were questions that sometimes I would have to read four or five times, not because I was overanalyzing it, but because I had no idea what it said. Like I could read mm. the words. I read the words. The words were read. The words went in my eyes. They went to my brain. It made no <laughs> sense, right? Yeah. And either they made no sense just for whatever reason, I couldn't get the sentence to make sense or because especially if it was a longer kind of paragraph or a longer question, my brain would wander. Right. And I would, and I'd miss stuff and I'd have to go back and read it again and again and again. And, and of course it was kind of a self-fulfilling thing. Like the more I had to do it, the more I had to do it. Like I'd, I'd start getting, then I'd start getting anxious. And then that made the, the focus worse yeah. if it's it. Right. And if it was, like short answer or essay stuff that took me even longer because not only did it take me a long time to kind of gather my thoughts and process mm -hmm. my thoughts and figure out how I wanted to write it down, but I write very slowly and I have very, you know, I, I was apparently destined to be a doctor because I had cruddy <laughs> handwriting ever. I was going to say that. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually, in fact, one of my favorite little stories is my sixth grade um, science teacher was looking at one of my tests and, and she looked at it and she looked at me and she looked at it and she looked at me and she goes, <sighs> Carrie, one of these days you're going to make a good doctor. And I looked at her cause I didn't know if she was talking about my score or my handwriting. <laughs> and I looked at her, I said, is that a compliment or an insult? And she said, both. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll take it. So I have horrible handwriting. It takes me physically. It, it takes me a long time to write. And especially if I have to write legibly, you know, for somebody else to read, it really is a challenge. And so, in fact, to this day, it's a challenge, which is part of why I use dictation software to help me with, get my charts done faster. Mm -hmm. um, and of course I have issues with spelling and all of that, which was also challenging. Although quick tip, if you have bad handwriting and you can't spell the bad handwriting helps because the bad handwriting is so bad, they can't tell you spelled it wrong. <laughs> That is okay. hilarious. One of my favorite tricks with the whole IE thing is just do, you know, two sweeping lines and put the <laughs> dot in the middle. And then they just kind of their eyes decide where the eye is supposed to be. Oh, my it God. Works. That's hilarious. It totally works. Um, so the workaround, things, folks. Right. It's a workaround. So those things are really challenging for me. And so, I mean, for example, on the SAT two subject tests, I did the writing test and my score because writing, and again, I didn't realize how much of a challenge it was for me. Just having the extra time on an 800 point scale, my, my score went up 300 points. Oh my word. Yeah. It went from like, huh. can you write to, Oh, well, hi there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really was remarkable and it, and it was, it was those, it was getting those scores back that made me go, Oh, Oh, Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's something about. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I think the diet, so that was the first thing that changed. And I think over time, definitely, I, cause I always knew I was different, right? I always mm -hmm. knew I did things differently. I always knew I had to do things differently. I always knew that I, I wasn't quite like all the other kids and that was just me. And so kind of, I do think starting to understand why and having a reason why and being able to understand that this is how my brain works was very helpful. And, and I was actually really, again, really lucky, really, really lucky when I went to college and I went to Davidson college in North Carolina, small, wonderful, small liberal arts school. And they, even back then they had a learning specialist and I, because I was getting accommodations, I had to meet with her and my previous experience with 
learning specialist hadn't actually necessarily been the most positive. So I was a little hesitant. And I went in to talk to her and the most wonderful woman in she's asking me about my studies habits and, and how I do things. And I was like, oh, well, I do it all wrong. And she goes, well, what do you mean you do it all wrong? I was like, well, I, when I highlight things, I don't highlight the main points. I highlight everything but and, the, and but. And, <laughs> you know, and I, and I don't like to take notes on note cards because that takes too much time. So I Xerox the textbook page and then, you know, or the library book page. And then I highlight it and da, 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 and all these things. And she goes, okay, tell me again why that's wrong. Ah. And I went, well, because that everybody's always told me that was wrong. And she was like, She's like, Carrie, you graduated from Hockaday in Dallas and you're at Davidson College. Tell me again how that's wrong. Wow. And I was like, uh, I mean, she was the first person to, when it came to that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. To tell me I wasn't wrong. Yeah. That, and she was like, let me tell you what you're doing and let me tell you why it's right. And she started explaining to me how what I was doing was compensating for my tracking issue and my processing issue by using the highlighter to keep me on track and to use kinetic learning as well as visual learning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's okay for me to read out loud to myself because that's also engaging the auditory and it's keeping me focused. And she's like, when you do it that way, do you have to go back and review it or do you remember it? I'm like, I I remember it. She's like, (laughs) okay, then there you go. You know, and same with all the other things. Now, certainly there were things that I could improve on, right? But just to have that validation of someone sitting there across from me being like, you're not wrong. You're you're very, very right, actually. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Was yes. just, was incredible, was incredible. And again, especially back then, which was a very long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, she gave you permission to do it your way. Yes, she gave me permission to be me. Yeah. Yeah, really. I mean, it's, it's more than just, oh, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> oh. It was more than just giving me permission to do it my way. It really was giving me permission to be me. Right. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that's why I still remember it 20, 20, 20 years later, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay, well, we could talk about this forever, and I'm sure, sure. <laughs> our audience is sitting there going, wait, wasn't this supposed to be about medication? No meds. <laughs> yeah, you've got two ADHD women here. What do you want? Right? Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a story, but I promise I'm going to get to the question. I am always trying to provide structure, not only for my women, but also for myself. That said, when it comes to medication, I have never felt that I could successfully create any kind of structure. So initially (laughs) I was put on Adderall. That didn't work. So then they tried Ritalin. I'm a slow metabolizer. Of course, we didn't realize that when we started. And these stimulants made me so anxious. They created all kinds of other symptoms. And frankly, it made my ADHD much worse. So much so that I ended up for a week on anxiety medication. So if you're on anxiety medication, forget the, you know, the ADHD stuff is like secondary, right? Right. The psychiatrist that I was trying to work with was clueless, and I seriously felt like a guinea pig. There was no thought or advice around, well, if, you know, these were your symptoms, maybe this would be a good medication or at least a good category of medication to try. So instead, I basically went and did the research myself, and then I told the psychiatrist, this is what we're going to try, which is literally like the blind leading the blind, right? Right, right. And so after that, I ended up hiring the head of all women's psychiatry in Northern California. She was, had been with Kaiser, actually. Now, I, I know they were part of a multi-million dollar <laughs> lawsuit regarding, <laughs> you know, mental health. But it was the same thing. So I was paying her, I think it was $650 an hour. And Holy crow, I was, I'm in the wrong business. I know. <laughs> I, was, I was literally a guinea pig again. And it was just so frustrating that I was paying that much money and I didn't really get that she had much advice other than, well, we just have to try. So I had, you know, I've got your drivenness. And so when I decide that I'm going to figure something out, hell, if I don't do it, you're going to do it. I'm going to figure it out. So two (laughs) years later, I realized I was so far afield from where I started that I couldn't even remember what it felt like to feel good. And at that point, I said, screw it. I'm not taking meds anymore. They just don't work. So this is my question. 
Is there any school of thought when it comes to ADHD in women that you start with one category of medication? I know they usually start with stimulants. And if that doesn't work or causes anxiety, then you go to category B and then you go to category C. Are there any rules or are we basically all guinea pigs and the way medication works (laughs) means that no one will really know what might be best to use first, second or third and we just have to try? (laughs) That's a great, okay, so wonderful. And this is, and I hear this, from my patients, right? All the time. And of course, you know, my patients are more, you know, teenagers and young adults as opposed to like, you know, adult women. But of course, being an adult woman with ADHD, you've been there, done that. And of course, I'm as a physician, I'm kind of looking at the whole lifespan, right? And you had a trying time with medication. I, I did. I did. So for me, I actually have tried just about every single stimulant known to man. (laughs) <laughs> and then, and some non-stimulants. Um, when I did finally decide to try medication, I was, it was actually honestly not all that long ago. I think it was, God, when was it like maybe five years ago? I mean, it was really, really late on. And especially for somebody who, who specializes in ADHD, it was kind of <laughs> ironic, but actually to kind of add to my story and, and to, to touch on what you're talking about, part of why I refused medication initially was yes, those things that I mentioned, but also I had a family member who went through some pretty significant side effects and Mm -hmm. some real difficulty finding the right medications themselves. And so I was kind of scarred by that for lack of a better word. And so that's the other reason why I kind of waited. So once I finally decided to start trying myself, I've been through them, man. I've been through literally just about (laughs) almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them. And I turns out that I too am a slow metabolizer I'm very sensitive to the medicine. I am prone to side effects and I build tolerance. Yay. Ah, can so you explain deep. slow metabolizer? Because I'm sure people yes. don't know what it is or many. Don't. Yes. And, and that is actually one of the big things I like to, to make sure people are clear on. So one of the things that's interesting about specifically stimulant medications, and this can occur with other medicines too, but this is really something that is particularly an issue with stimulant medications. When we talk about metabolism, we're not talking about food metabolism. Okay. We're talking about simply how your liver processes these medications, which is based on primarily the genetics of certain enzymes, how active certain enzymes are that your liver produces. Okay. So people can be an average metabolizer. We'll use Concerta as the example. Okay. Concerta is a methylphenidate that on average lasts 10 to 12 hours. So if you're an average metabolizer, that medicine is going to last 10 to 12 hours in your system. If you're a slow metabolizer, meaning your body does not process this medicine as fast as someone else, the Concerta could last 14, 16 hours. So these are the people for whom that medicine might keep them up at night, right? Like way into the night, okay? And so for that person, something that has a shorter duration of action is probably going to be a better choice. If you're a fast metabolizer, it means your liver processes these medicines faster than usual. So for that person, Concerta might last more like six to eight hours. I actually have some patients where I have to dose more than once a day, a long acting preparation because they're that fast of a metabolizer. I actually have one sweet child that bless him. I have to dose him with two different long, a long acting, then a slightly shorter acting, long acting, and then a short acting. Wow. Just to get him you know, through his day. This has nothing to do with weight, height, gender. Nope. Nope. Nothing to do with any of that. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, for example, as a result of me being a slow metabolizer, an immediate release formulation lasts most of the working day for me. Right. Which was one of the things we had to figure out. I'm like, when I tried Concerta, I'm like up at one o'clock in the morning, but not being my usual productive up at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> staring at the ceiling going, well, this sucks because, you know, tomorrow's now going to be trash, <laughs> you know, like awesome. So glad. So yeah, that can be one of the things that can be really tricky. And, you know, coming back around to your original question about like kind of the guinea pig scenario, I, I again, I get that a lot from, from my patients and from experiences they've had before. And I think so much of that really has to do with, and so much of what you really were just talking about has to do with communication and education. No, there really isn't. I I tell my patients all the time, my magic eight ball is in the shop along with my magic wand, unfortunately, (laughs) 
you know, they're really, unless we have like, for example, if I have someone who comes in and like the whole family is on Adderall, the whole family swears by Adderall, you know, they've tried other stuff. It didn't work. Okay, fine. Adderall is probably going to be the one for you. Right. That's usually not the scenario that I get though. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't have a significant family history, it is kind of a, we just have to try them and see, but I think there's a really, really big difference for people when your doctor says, and this is what I do with my patients I, is I tell them straight up from the beginning, this is the process. This is the one we're going to start. And we're going to start it because I think this, you know, has a good shot at working for you because of X, Y, and Z. We will likely have to try different doses. We may have to try different medications. We may have to try several different medications at several different doses. We may have to try some additional meds added to that. We could hit the nail on the head right out of the gate. And if we do, awesome. But be prepared that we may, this may take a while and we may have to try different things. And I think setting that expectation in and of itself is so helpful and it, it completely shifts your mindset and how you feel about it when you're having to try these different medications, right? And if I have a plan as to like, okay, if X, then Y, if Y, then Z, I'll tell them that. And, you know, if I have a kid that I'm like, like it's happened this week where I was like, okay, you know what? We're going to try one more dose of this one. If that works great, if you get side effects or what have you, then my next plan is to try this one. So that they know that I've got a plan. They know that we've got something coming down the line, right? And I try to tell them the reasoning too. To your point, you felt like you didn't really know why, right? So yeah. I try to give them my reasoning behind why I'm trying X, Y, and Z, as well as what I want them to watch for that could be positive, as well as what I want them to watch for that could be a side effect. So that if we do have those side effects, they don't come back. And I'll joke with them sometimes too, like, you know, I don't want you cursing my name in the middle of the night because I kept you up all night, you know, that kind of thing. And then they just kind of laugh about it. So, but yeah, unfortunately there's not a magic eight ball. Now we do have some guidance, like for example, in pediatrics from ages four to six, that's the only age range we don't recommend medication as first line or as part of the first line treatment plan, just because they tend to have, <clears throat> they have a little bit higher risk of having side effects with the stimulant medications. But if they need to, if, if other things like parent training doesn't and classroom accommodations aren't sufficient, it's okay to start medication. And in that age range, we do have data to suggest that the methylphenidates are going to be the best place to start. Um, in my personal experience, and again, I, this is not necessarily based on data, but I think more and more of us who do ADHD are kind of leaning this way. If I don't have family history to go on. I will often start with a methylphenidate first because statistically speaking, there's slightly less risk of some of the side effects like anxiety, decreased appetite, um, weight loss than there are with the amphetamines. But do I have patients for whom they tolerate the amphetamines better than they tolerate the methylphenidates? Sure I do, right? So again, you kind of have to set that expectation. As far as kind of guidelines for women, one of the things that has been challenging, but I am encouraged because it is starting to change is data, right? In order to have guidelines, in order to have recommendations and protocols as to, to how to start with a particular age group or a particular gender, we have to have research on that age group and gender, right? Yep. yep. We haven't had research on adult <laughs> women with ADHD. It hasn't existed until well, recently. Because right, and that's hormones, right? They get in the right? way. Ugh, don't yeah. get me started. Um, <laughs> this podcast will be very, very long. No, in all seriousness, though, we part of that though is because in order to have research, you also have to have subjects, and to have subjects, you have to have people who are diagnosed. And most of us were not diagnosed. We weren't diagnosed as kids. We weren't diagnosed as adults. We slipped through the cracks because the way we viewed ADHD until fairly recently was all those symptoms, those externalizing symptoms that are more common in males than they are in females, right? Now, the good news is we now recognize this. And the good news is, is that more women than ever, the biggest group of people who are getting diagnosed and treated more and more for ADHD are adult women. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Okay. And, and it's because we're finally getting diagnosed. We're finally getting recognized. We're understanding how these symptoms look in women better and how they're different than in men. Now that we're getting folks diagnosed, now we're starting to get the interest in the research. Now we have the numbers of people to do the research on, right? So I am optimistic that I think down the road in the next, you know, five to 10 years, what have you, we're going to start having more data that might actually give us better guidance as to where to start adult women, because our brains are different. Our hormones are different. And let me take a minute to just kind of pause right here and say, when I'm saying talking about adult women with ADHD, I am primarily speaking about, and the research about cis women with ADHD. So women who were um, identified as female at birth and continue to identify as female, because Mm -hmm. one of the other things that is an area that needs to be researched is of course, transgender women, because that is, there's still the hormones involved there. And how does that affect ADHD? And how does that affect medication? So the interesting challenge is going to be researching women as a whole and seeing what the recommendations are there and if there's any differences, right? If there's any differences in the recommendation for medications. But, you know, we do have to look at, at those issues. And I think right now, where I, what I see a lot of adult women, a lot of adults, period, getting started on is Vyvanse. And Vyvanse is a great medication. It's very effective for the people for whom it works for. And there is some data to suggest that the amphetamines may be more effective in adults than the methylphenidates, although I'm, uh, um, my, <laughs> my, it's, you know, we need more data and we need more data in women. Okay. I, my thing with the Vyvanse is it's for the right person. It's a great medication, but it's very long acting. It has um, higher risk of anxiety, irritability, decreased appetite, weight loss, et cetera. I actually tried it myself. It was great for my ADHD. My kitchen was clean. Have no idea to this day how that happened. <laughs> I still remember passing a toy on the staircase, picking it up and putting it away. <laughs> how did that happen? I was like, wait a minute. This is, it was actually the first medicine I tried. I was like, this is how other people live. Are you serious right now? It was really, it really was kind of shocking, but it jacked up my heart rate. I couldn't exercise. I lost weight. I wanted to rip somebody's head off. Mm -hmm. Like there were some things that weren't so great for me personally. So I do think that's where a lot of people start. And unfortunately, if you are one of those, what I see frequently or relatively frequently, I should say, is if you're not one of the people for whom that works and you are one of the people who has significant side effects with it, they can be so significant that then you're just like, I'm done. Oh no, I'm not trying anything else. Right. And it's like, ah, no, there are other options. So do you know why? Because I think you're absolutely right. I hear from so many women, I'll say that 40 plus range, they discover Mm -hmm. that, oh, it's ADHD. And that is the first thing they're put on is Vyvanse. Why is that for women? Is that just kind of the drug of choice, the stimulant of choice for women, older women? I should say (laughs) middle-aged. So, (laughs) hey. (laughs) It's better than older. I I identify with that remark. Hold on. Um, I think it's multifaceted. I think there's, I think there's several things at play. I think, you know, like I said, there is, there's some research there, but I think there's also uh, marketing. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. Mm -hmm. Um, There's marketing. There's, you know, I think there's also for one of my, one of the things that I would really, 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 really love to do. And I, I, I try to do is, is, educate. I think there's so many ADHD for such a prevalent disorder, right? Is something that we're still needing to do a better job of educating med students, residents, Mm -hmm. and practicing physicians. And that's psychiatry, that's pediatrics, that's med peds, that's family practice, that's internal medicine. And it's just one of those things that if you, if you don't do enough of it, if you don't do a lot of it and you don't and you weren't given a solid background in it, which many of us weren't, right? In in training, 
if you're not comfortable with these meds, it, as a physician, it can be scary and you want to do what's best for your patient. And if you don't feel like you can do the best for your patient, then you may choose to just not do it. Right. Yeah. And that's not, that's not being, that's not being a bad physician. That's being a good physician. That's knowing your limits. Right. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. we need, we need more physicians to be comfortable, right? We need more physicians to understand the medications better and to feel more comfortable with them. And so, you know, again, when you're not as comfortable with it, you're typically going to have, and this goes for pretty much any condition, right? You're going to have a couple of medicines that you're really comfortable with and that you have experience with and that you feel you can use and monitor and adjust safely. And if that works for your patients, then great. And if it doesn't, then you're going to refer on, right? And so I think that's kind of where a lot of that comes from. I think the other issue is, is again, with particularly with adult women is a lot of adult physicians, at least as pediatricians, we do obviously get some training in ADHD. And I still think we need to have more and better training, but it's getting there. Right. And because it's considered a childhood disorder, that is part of what we're, what we're trained on adult physicians still really don't get a whole lot of training in that. Cause again, the adults are just now, our generation wasn't diagnosed when we were younger very much. And we're just now getting diagnosed. And so there's just, as a result, there just isn't a whole lot of experience for folks out there. And if you're not familiar with the meds and you're not comfortable with the meds, you're not comfortable with the condition. It's, it can be scary as a physician because you, you know, first do no harm, right? Liability. (laughs) Yeah. And, And it's, well, it's not just liability. I mean, it's truly like not not wanting to harm your patient, not wanting to make it worse. And when you do know that these medicines can, for example, increase anxiety, right? I think one of the big, one of the big tricky things I think with women and ADHD in particular, right? Is we know that adults with ADHD, 50% of them will also have a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And frankly, I think most folks listening to this would agree that's a low number. (laughs) <laughs> I, I think, because how I think can you have ADHD, ADHD have anxiety right, right. because and it's your brain. brain it's the thoughts right too many right. thoughts too many ideas oh my gosh how can you be an adult woman with yeah. ADHD and not have anxiety because I agree adult woman with ADHD is anxiety provoking totally it agree just is, right yeah. so so the challenge is and and this is actually the other issue and 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 I speak on this sometimes is part of the challenge we've had with diagnosing women in general throughout the lifespan, including my patient population, is because women and girls tend to internalize symptoms more than Mm -hmm. externalize symptoms. First of all, it's just not as obvious, right? We cause more problems for ourselves than we do anybody else. (laughs) Exactly. And and as a result, when we usually present to the medical provider, we're presenting with the depression. We're presenting with the anxiety. We're presenting Mm -hmm. with the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. that resulted from the untreated or unrecognized ADHD or the ADHD with the comorbid depression or anxiety or whatever else, right? And so what is first seen by ourselves as well as by our, our medical providers is the depression or anxiety. So sometimes we end up getting that treated first when sometimes that needs to happen, right? Sometimes we need to treat the depression and anxiety first and then go, oh, hi, there's the ADHD and circle back around to it. But sometimes what we actually need to treat is the ADHD yeah, because that's what's leading to, say, for example, the anxiety. But again, the tricky part is if I have a, and this is for my patient population too, if I have someone who presents and there's clearly anxiety and there's clearly ADHD, which do I treat first? Because there's the chance that I treat the ADHD and the anxiety gets better or at least gets is with the impulse control and the ADHD managed and better emotional regulation, they're able to manage the anxiety without additional medication. There's also the chance that the stimulant medication is going to make their anxiety worse, right? And sometimes I have a pretty good sense as to which direction we're going to go. And sometimes I really don't. And sometimes I think I have a good idea and we try something and the opposite happens. Now, the big piece of this is I tell them that I tell them that yeah. I say, okay, here's the sitch. Here's what we're going to do and why. And here's what I want you to watch for. And if X happens, then we're going to do Y. And if Y happens, then we're going to do X. And sometimes if I'm, if it's really not clear, 
I'll, I'll even give, I'll say, Hey, look, this is kind of what I'm thinking. These are the options. It's your body. What do you want to do? What is your comfort level? Right. Because sometimes we just, we really don't know until we try, but that, that combination of anxiety and ADHD is, is part of what can make it truly tricky to both diagnose and treat women properly. I mean, really everybody, but I think, I do think it's more of an issue for women. And you mentioned the hormones. Duh. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. the other thing that can make it really tricky, right? Because fluctuations in our hormones, estrogen and dopamine are completely tied to each other, right? And dopamine is one of the primary neurotransmitters that we know it plays a significant role in ADHD. So before our periods, during our periods, not only can our anxiety get worse, or our depression get worse, or our irritability get worse, but our ADHD gets worse. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You know, and we get to have the babies. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, don't, e- I was gonna say, don't even get me started on, you know, pregnancy and menopause and menarche right. and all the other fun stuff. So right? what I would love if you wouldn't mind sharing is we have these categories of medication and you threw some of them out like methylphenidate Mm -hmm. versus amphetamine. And can you just go through the categories of medication and just give kind of like, you know, maybe a two line description of that medication, what it does, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. It'll be more than two lines. I just realized that. (laughs) That's okay. No, no, no. It's all good. So let's start with the stimulants. There are two families of stimulants. There's the methylphenidates and there's the amphetamines. The methylphenidates increase available dopamine in the brain. So I mentioned dopamine is one of the primary neurotransmitters we know is an issue in ADHD. So methylphenidates work by increasing available dopamine in the brain by decreasing reuptake. So what that means is when neurotransmitters are released from one brain cell, cross over to the another brain cell to send a signal. Okay. Once they've done that, they're released from the receptor on the brain cell. They just sent the signal to, and they're taken back up into the previous cell and recycled processed out. Right. The methylphenidates prevent that from happening to a certain extent, which enables that same molecule to kind of, to send more signals and, and, and function more and do more things right before it gets um, taken out of the system. The amphetamines work by increasing available dopamine in the brain as well, but they do so by increasing the brain cells release of dopamine. Okay. So that's kind of the core difference of both of those. Now for the methylphenidates in that class, those are things like trade names you might recognize are Ritalin, Concerta, Focalin, Daytrana, Quilavent, Quilichu, et cetera. There's Jornet. There's, there's so many. The good news is we've got choices. The bad news is we have choices, right? <laughs> so there's Metadate is another one. All of those except for Focalin are the same molecule. It's methylphenidate. It's the same molecule. It's just different preparations. But what's fascinating about that is that those different preparations, which change, for example, how long it lasts, how much medicine is released at what time, just changing that formulation can completely change how effective a medication is or what side effects a given individual has. So that's one of the reasons why I always tell people like, okay, so if Concerta didn't work for you or if it it caused too many side effects, you may not want to just ditch on the methylphenidates. You might want to try a different preparation or different formulation, such as like say Metadate or what have you because you may have a totally different experience with that. Now, if I have a patient who's been on, you know, say two different methylphenidates and they have kind of the same issues, Mm -hmm. okay, fine. I get the picture. Time to ditch that and move to the other class, right? Now, Focalin is the one that's a little bit different in that class. And the difference is that it's what we call dex methylphenidate. So what that is, is for all the other preparations that are just good old methylphenidate, is that there's actually, it's the same molecule, but there's actually mirror image molecules 
of methylphenidate in preparation with each other. We call one dexmethylphenidate or the right-handed molecule, and the other one is levo or the left-handed molecule. So in dexmethylphenidate, they took out the levo and they left just the right-handed, the dex molecule. The theory was kind of that like, okay, we think this is the version of the molecule that is causing all the good stuff, if you will. And the other one maybe is causing more of the side effects. Great in theory, not so much in practice. For some people, that's absolutely the case. For some people, the focalin is significantly more effective and more tolerable than the other methylphenidates. For some people, the other methylphenidates are much more tolerable than the focalin. Mm. And in general, and again, this is this is purely Dr. Parcell's personal experience. <laughs> this is not data, okay, research. But in general, I find that my folks, my young, my younger folks who have um, irritability, agitation, anxiety, aggression, not all the time, but oftentimes actually get worse. Those things tend to get worse with the focalin than with the methylphenidate. Now, again, I've got exceptions to that rule. I've got kids with those, with those challenges that do very well on focalin, but just in general, that's kind of what I see. And of course, in that class, we've got the short acting and the long acting. The short acting is pretty much just good old methylphenidate. Okay. Um, in the average metabolizer, that's going to last about three to five hours in a, in someone like me much longer, mm -hmm. you never know. So we tend to use the short acting more as a booster dose. Although I do find adults getting prescribed the short acting as their primary medicine more often than we do kids, because frankly, insurance coverage, ah. they're cheaper. Okay? okay. But part of why we don't like using those as the primary medicine is you're seriously going to ask someone with ADHD to remember to take their medicine two to three times a day? Yeah. Really? Really? Yeah, that's going to work. Okay. Um, no, it won't. Get me started. No, <laughs> yeah, no, it won't. I can, speak, I can speak from personal experience. <laughs> no, it won't. Okay. I have an alarm set at four o'clock. How many times do I take my second dose? I, I can't even tell you. Anywho. Now the amphetamines, we have the same thing, right? We've got short acting, we've got long acting. The, the ones that most people are familiar with in that class are going to be Adderall. Adderall is the short acting. Adderall XR is the long acting. Vyvanse, Avicio, uh, Dynavel. They've got a bunch of different formulations in that arena too. One of the things that's a little bit different with the amphetamine. So again, you have the amphetamine molecule. The difference in the preparations, there's a little bit more differences here because Yes, there's the difference in, in how it's prepared and how long it lasts, but there's also a difference, as I mentioned, those that kind of dex molecule versus the levo molecule. There's the difference between the different preparations. There's also a difference in not just duration, but the percentage of dexamphetamine. So for example, Adderall XR is approximately 75% dexamphetamine. Avicio is 50-50. And Vyvanse is like the focalin. Vyvanse is dex, it's actually Liz dexamphetamine. And the difference there is so, yes, it's just the dex molecule, but in addition to that, they tack this little Liz portion onto it. And what's pretty stinking cool about that actually is it's what we call a pro drug. And it's called a pro drug because in its form, before it's taken into the body, it's not actually active. You take it in, it goes through, it has to go through the gut. And at a certain point in the gut, there's an enzyme that cleaves off that Liz portion. And then and only then can it be absorbed into the system. Huh. Yeah. And what's really cool about that is it, there's still variation on metabolism of this one, but there's a little less variation in metabolism on it. But the other big piece of it is it decreases the risk of um, misuse. That makes sense because you don't get it right away. The effect. Correct. And okay. if you take it in, in a way it shouldn't be ingested, it's not going to do what it does. Or at what least do you mean by that, let me put it that way. If you crush it up and snort it. Oh, okay. It's not going to do the same thing as if you do that with Adderall. Got by it. the way, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Can I just put that out there right now? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> don't do that. Okay. Okay. But that was one of the big reasons why they did that. And so, yeah, so that's kind of the differences between those different medications and, and the different formulations. Now there's also, do you want to, do you want me to jump on the so, non-stimulants real quick? So Carolyn, these are all the stimulants that we've just talked Correct. about. And now we're talking yes. about non-stimulant medications. Non-stimulants. Yeah. Okay. So the stimulants real quick is just kind of a last thing on those. 
They are the gold standard first line medication for ADHD. And they are such because they are the ones that throughout the research have been shown to be the most effective. Okay. Now, the other thing that I, I like people to be aware of is these are not new. The formulations are new and fancy. Amphetamines and methylphenidates have been around since the 1930s and 40s. Yep. We have been using them since the 1930s and 40s. These ain't new. Okay. Now, that's my last little deal there. The non stimulants. So, one of the primary non stimulants we've been using more and more is the trade name is Intuniv. The generic is Guanfazine ER. Mm-hmm. And Guanfazine and, and its cousin, Clonidine, are what we call uh, alpha adrenergic agonists, which is a fancy word for um, old school blood pressure medicine, (laughs) basically. And what they do, it's really interesting because we don't know exactly how they work in ADHD, but I think it makes a lot of sense because what what we do know they do is decrease, what we call decrease sympathetic outflow, which the sympathetic nervous system is essentially your fight or flight system, Ah. right? So what these medicines do is they essentially chill out the fight or flight system. Well, what do they do for people with ADHD? What they're best used for is hyperactivity, impulsivity, irritability, sleep, and emotional regulation. Kind of makes sense, right? These are the ones for RSD, right? Rejection sensitive dysphoria. So (laughs) yes-ish. Yes. Hold on to that thought for just a second. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Um, This is fabulous, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> it's what I was going to say is they, they're not anti-anxiety medicines, but I do find that for my patients who have ADHD and anxiety, mm. sometimes this can be really helpful or it can be really helpful for them to be able to tolerate the stimulant better. Ah. And so what they're not as good for is focus and attention. And they have not been shown to be as effective as the stimulants or as good as the stimulants as a standalone, but they are very, very nice adjunct to a stimulant. They balance each other, I think, really nicely. And so coming back around to your point of the RSD, it is the medicine that we are looking at, I shall say, for rejection sensitivity dysphoria. And I think I'll, I'll give you my little spiel just real quick on the, on the RSD. I think rejection sensitivity dysphoria, I think it's an interesting entity. I think it's an interesting term. I do like that it helps us to kind of understand that piece of our ADHD a little bit better. I don't think it's its own thing though, if that makes sense. Like it doesn't surprise me that it goes along with ADHD. If you think about the fact that we have impulsivity, we have difficulty with emotional regulation largely because of our impulsivity and we can perseverate and hyper-focus on things, including things like, did we, or did we not pick up on that social cue correctly? Totally. Or hyper-focusing on what that person said or what that person did or what we said or what we did, right? So I think it makes sense with just what ADHD is. And so to that point, right, if we look at rejection sensitivity dysphoria as the lovely mishmash that comes along with the impulsivity, the hyper-focus, basically being revved, having that sympathetic nervous system revved up, right? Mm -hmm. It would make sense that this medicine has the potential for that. Now, what I'm interested to see as more data comes out is how well it's tolerated by adults. Because in my personal, in my practice, I use it a lot in my younger kids for, you know, the really hyperactive behavior, the aggressive behavior, the irritability, all of those things. It can be a real game changer. It can be an absolute life-changing medication for a lot of kids. The main side effects are tiredness and dizziness. And I, I feel like I've seen more fatigue, the older they get Uh, than with my little ones. But again, that's just based on my, you know, relatively small numbers in the overall scheme of things. So I think it'll be interesting to see the data on it, but it, it can be, it can be a really great um, adjunct and, and the long acting version. So the intuitive you know, can be taken during the day and can give us anywhere from 12 to 24 hours of coverage. So it can also be really great for, you know, those evening times and morning times when our stimulants not active, but, but life still is. And we have so many things to deal with at those times. (laughs) Um, It can be, it can be helpful for that. Um, The shorter acting or immediate release versions of clonidine and guampazine can actually be great for sleep. 
especially for ADHD sleep or lack thereof, because we tend to have difficulty with sleep initiation or getting to sleep because our brains don't stop. I like to call it the ADHD brain spin. So (laughs) yeah. So those medications can actually be really helpful for folks with ADHD who are having difficulty sleeping as well. Now, the other non-stimulants, Stratera, of course, is one that a lot of people are aware of. That's what we call a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. And norepinephrine is the other neurotransmitter that we know, you know, mm-hmm. likely plays a pretty significant role in, in ADHD. And so you would think that, you know, that would be helpful. I will tell you that the data is not great on it. And the more data we get, the worse it looks. In practice, it's not very effective. There are definitely, don't get me wrong, there's certainly people out there for whom it works very well. And for those people, great, right? But it can have quite a few side effects. It takes anywhere from six to eight to sometimes even 12 weeks to take full effect, which is a real challenge for us. And it just hasn't been shown to be nearly as effective. So most of us who really do a lot of ADHD work are really stepping away from Stratera, to be perfectly honest. So Um, interesting. I thought it was hell. I had so much anxiety because of that drivenness. I was like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. I thought it was hell. Yeah. (laughs) Personally. There's, like I said, there's a reason why most of us who do a lot of this work are not using it much anymore at all. Good to know. Um, The one, the one that, you know, then there's Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin mm. is an antidepressant that, again, has kind of more of a dopamine effect than than anything else, but it's kind of in a class of its own. And well, it's not an SSRI, is, right? No, it's not an SSRI. Okay, it's it's its own jam. It's its okay. own thing. <laughs> and uh, it's in a it's in a party by itself. <laughs> and Wellbutrin is great because now, again, on its own for ADHD symptoms, not shown to be as effective as a stimulant. For some folks, it may be enough, you know, it may be enough to kind of just give them a little bit, um, a little bit more relief from those symptoms, um, especially if they can't tolerate a stimulant or stimulant alone hasn't been sufficient. It can be a good go-to for depression and ADHD Mm -hmm. because it is a good antidepressant. It's not the best anti-anxiety medicine on the face of the earth, but again, for some people with ADHD, it can, it could be helpful for their anxiety. It can be some people, it can be really good as an adjunct to their stimulant for some people. That's a little too much dopamine, you know, and then the Wellbutrin with a stimulant can be a little too, shall Mm -hmm. we say, activating, Mm -hmm. stimulating. Mm -hmm. You can get a little jazzed. (laughs) Um, And for some people it can actually make them more irritable, more anxious, you know, that kind of stuff. And of course it like we've been talking about with all these medicines, everybody's different and and sometimes you just have to try it. But that's how we typically use the Wellbutrin. Pretty much everything else, as far as non-stimulants are concerned, are kind of like you're talking third, fourth, fifth line type of stuff. So those are really kind of the main ones. What about amantadine? Have you heard anything about that? That, you know, I've heard a little bit. I don't use it. I'm not terribly okay. experienced with it. So I hesitate to speak on it too much. My understanding is that again, it just hasn't been shown to be as effective. Okay. But again, that's not one that I feel like I can really speak to in an expert level, you know? Got it. Well, can I tell you that (laughs) I have, um, Ned Hallowell and John Rady's ADHD 2.0 book open here. And there's yes. a whole section. I love it. There's a whole section on medication and it's a graph. And you literally walked through it. I understand <laughs> medication. So, well, I feel like I have a structure I like now. It. I get it. Yes. And yes. I, I know that we ran really long. This is, I think, the longest podcast I've ever done. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, this was so amazingly helpful. I really feel like I've oh, totally got a handle on it. So, I can't even begin to thank you. One final question. Well, I actually have two really quick ones. What do you think about genetic testing? Has it gotten to the point that it's helpful at all? I mean, at least you'd be able to tell if you're a slow metabolizer, right? Yeah. So that's a great question. So the genetic, the pharmacogenetic testing, I think there's a lot of potential there. For ADHD, I think it's more beneficial. The, The data suggests that it's potentially more beneficial when you're looking at antidepressants and those kinds of medications than necessarily with the ADHD medications. Ah. Yes, it can tell us or at least give us um, potential clues as to 
you know, are you a fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer? For some people, it might also give us an idea as to, do we want to start with the methylphenidates or do we want to start with the amphetamines? But first of all, it ain't perfect by any mm-hmm. stretch of the means. And so sometimes it's, you know, we, we use that guidance and it's wrong. But the other issue is, is it's not cheap. It's often not covered by insurance. And is it really going to save us any time or effort or what have you over simply trying the medicine, right? The first stimulant I try, I now know if you're a fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer, right? Ah, You know, like we get that information pretty quick. Got it. From just using the medications. I do think there's potential there. I think it's, in general, how most of us who use the pharmacogenetic testing, and I, I do use it some, but as it stands right now, again, it's not a magic bullet. So I always caution people as to their expectations with it. And I think it's more helpful or can be potentially more helpful when we have somebody who's either going to be on multiple medications or maybe needs to be on multiple medications or has tried several things and is really struggling to find something that's either effective or tolerable. Like they, they tend Mm -hmm. to have a lot of side effects, that kind of stuff. Then I think it can be more useful there, but it is a tool that's not a perfect tool. Okay. I remember when I was going through all this medication, I'd have all these spreadsheets trying to remember symptoms because, you know, our ADHD is like, I can't remember, Uh, like, how did it feel to feel good? So do you have any applications, (laughs) especially for kids? Because I would think that is really important information. Do you, can you recommend like tracking applications or, or what do you do? No, I can't because I would love, and if someone wants to make one, let me know. No, in all seriousness, I was actually literally, it's so funny you asked me this. I was literally just talking with a mom about this today for exactly this reason, because she was trying to think back to these different medicines that the kiddo had been on and, and the kid was trying to think back too. And, you know, mm-hmm. especially if it's been a couple of years since you started this process, like, yeah, of course it's going to run together. And the part of the question was even what was remembering, well, what should we be looking for? Right? Yeah you know, what should we be looking for, for both adverse effects or, you know, side effects or, or good effects. And I was like, Oh, we need something like that. We absolutely need something like that. And there may be something like that out there, but I'll be honest, I'm not familiar with it. So if somebody else is, please let me know because yes, it would be very helpful. (laughs) Wonderful. Okay. One final question. What do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? (laughs) Again, to quote my mother. To quote uh, my mother, staff up. <laughs> wait, wait, what? Staff up. Asking what does for, that mean, staff up? My mom's funny way of saying asking for help. Ah. Yeah. Ask for help. And I think it's one of the things that is not only one of the most crucial things for us, but it's also one of the hardest things for us, mm-hmm. especially for those of us who are highly independent women who as women were expected to do everything for everyone, (laughs) including ourselves and asking for help with your ADHD as an adult woman can be one of the hardest things we ever do. It can also be the, one of the most important things we ever do. You know, am I going to get my dishes clean? No. Can I find someone who can help me with that? Yes. Right. Um, I, I am I going to manage, right? Am I going to, yeah. am I going to stay on track and manage my business all by myself? No, I have an amazing practice manager who does not have ADHD, <laughs> who, who keeps a running to-do list for me, right. To remind me of stuff and help me stay on track. I use an ADHD coach. God, I wish I knew about ADHD coaches when I was younger it's asking for help. It's asking for help from the right people and it's getting over asking for help. Okay. Staff up. I love that. Tell your mom. I love it. Yes. (laughs) It's great. So Carolyn, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? Certainly. So our website, www.gtw-health.com. 
you will find me. You will also find my colleagues. Um, we have a clinic in Fort Worth, Texas. There's also a location in Dallas and another one in McKinney, which is just north of Dallas. And that is also where you can find me for and find my email for questions, for uh, speaking, for all that fun stuff. So that was um, www.gtw-help.com. Sorry, dash health. H E A L C H dot com. <laughs> not, not help. Not help. <laughs> Although okay. that, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> that will be in the show notes. Anyway, Carolyn, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. You now have the distinction of talking the longest on our podcast, but it was so informative, so helpful. I'm so glad that we did it. Thank you. Me too. Me too. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So that's what I have for you for this week. This episode of ADHD for Smart Ass Women was brought to you by Your ADHD Brain is a OK, our six step system that shows you how to fall in love with your ADHD brain. If you'd like more information, join our waitlist at tracyotsuka.com forward slash waitlist. If you like this episode with Dr. Lynch Parcells, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. And you know what? Your reviews really help in that regard. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com. You'll find options there to leave me a message. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.